Ah, hello. I'm your professor. My name is Lauren Geithner. I'm going to be recording um, video uh, clips like this one whenever time permits. I can't guarantee I will be doing that for every week. But I want to share some thoughts with you all about at least uh, some of the information in the um, text of the assignments, but also about the first chapter. I don't think I'll have time enough to get to the fifth chapter today, hopefully in the next year or two. So let me share a couple concerns and a little and a few things that I think call for elaboration. So even before we get to the assigned reading for this week, I'd like to raise an issue about one of the discussion questions this week, which shares Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction. Now, Aristotle is one of the most important philosophers of all time and his treatise, treatise on logic still redounds to this day. In this treatise, he sets out the principle of non-contradiction. Although this principle may seem to most of us in the West to be intuitive, it does raise some issues and there are some alternative approaches to logic. First, in terms of issues, Aristotle's logic is essentially dualist. Most of the propositions considered are either or, uh, black, and it's black and white, if you will. It thus lends itself to experimental science, which seeks to establish unambiguous and objective truths about the natural world. However, there is an important issue with that in application into ethics. Most human experience falls on a continual instead of falling into neat black and white, either or extremes. For example, let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say that you discover that a friend's wife is cheating on him. On the one hand, there's an ethical duty to tell the truth. But on the other hand, there's a duty not to hurt another person's feelings unduly. And on the, can we say a third hand, do you even have a duty to interfere with someone else's personal life? We tend to turn to ethics in this kind of situation where there is a conflict between two or more prima facie values, but given a such a conflict between two goods, truth telling versus not unduly hurting people's feelings, how are we to decide if our only tool is the principle of non-contradiction? Sometimes we have to weigh not good against evil or good against bad, but rather one thing that's bad, another that's worse. One thing that's good, but one thing that's better. Alternatives. Although Aristotelian logic is the form of logic that is the default in the West, there are alternatives. For example, Jewish religious law, which is known as halakha, tends to default to a both and rather than an either or duality. And in Jewish rabbinical courts, which are called Beth Din, the emphasis is not so much on finding one party guilty and the other not guilty, but rather to man immediate a solution that will be satisfactory to both parties. Um, by the way, this tops, taps into a topic I've been researching for a projected publication. There are some really fascinating correspondences between Halakha and the ancient Irish Brehan law and Navajo tribal law. Fascinating. So does Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction, which works splendidly for addressing empirical issues, apply just as well to moral propositions, given that different people can have differing moral beliefs? Uh, see chapter five, which I'll hopefully be talking about shortly in the next year or two. Are ethical statements absolute or relative? Or is perhaps there a balance to be, to be struck between the two positions? Turning to chapter one, let me observe, observe that the text describes three types of ethics, descriptive, normative, and metaethics. Now, those are three of the important schools of ethics, but there's a fourth one that I think it omits and I think it's worth referring to. And that is what we call applied or professional ethics. Applied ethics is the application of ethics within a particular, within a particular context. Doctors, journalists, lawyers, for example, each have an ethical, each have ethical duties unique to their duties, professions, and roles. Sometimes these duties can even conflict with what would ordinarily be considered moral. 
Let me give you an example. And this is an example from my own life. I think it is fairly self-evident, for example, that if you as a citizen were to find out that someone had committed murder, you would have a duty to report that to the proper authorities. But I used to work in criminal law. If I had a client who having paid my retainer confessed to me, I would have an ethical duty not to report to the authorities because to do so would violate client attorney privilege. Similar ethical dilemmas can occur in other professions depending upon the duties and roles of the given profession. Let us say, for example, that a doctor is operating on a pregnant woman and he's suddenly put in the position of having to choose whether to save the life of the child or to save the life of the mother. Which one should he prefer? Now, we're not going to go into professional ethics in depth in this class, but I thought it was worth mentioning this omission because this is another major area of ethics. Indeed, there are professionals who specialize just in the fields of medical or legal ethics for a living. The text also mentions the notion of individual morality, which is to say the moral values of an individual decides upon for themselves. The text gives the example of Antigone, but my suspicion is that Antigone is probably a bit obscure for most people. I think there's a better example, and that example is from American popular culture, but I don't want to leave any spoilers. So if you don't want a classic work of American pop culture, uh, detective fiction, fiction specifically to be spoiled, stop watching this video now. Read the text version, which I will be posting along with this, or vice versa. So let's talk about the notion of individual morality. Now, in the American 20th century picture, popular fiction, there evolved an archetype, the notion of what was called a code hero, which is to say a hero who had a moral code, but it was kind of out of sync with conventional morality. Let me give you an example. And for this, I think I need to turn to my share function. And ah, where is the share function here? Ah, here we go. So here's a classic figure from American popular fiction, Sam Spade, Humphrey Bogart, one of my favorite actors in the movie, The Maltese Falcon. Now, does Sam Spade have personal morality? Does he have conventional morality? Well, we know if you've read the book or more likely watched the movie, Sam Spade does not have conventional morality. He is, it's early on established that he's having an affair with his partner's wife. So not conventional morality. Does that mean, however, that he has no code, no personal morality? Well, he ends up, here's the spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Here's the spoiler. He ends up in the situation of either um, avenging his partner's murder or sending a woman that he thinks he might have fallen in love with to jail. In fact, he states in so many words when he's questioned as to why he chooses to send her to jail instead, he states he's guiding moral principle. When a man's partner is killed, he's supposed to do something about it. It doesn't make any difference what you thought of him. He was your partner and you're supposed to do something about it. Then it happens, we were in the detective business. Well, when one of your organization gets killed, it's bad business to let the killer get away with it. It's bad all around, bad for that one organization, bad for every detective everywhere. Well, let me drop out of the share function for just a moment and point out that part of the reason why I'm sharing that example is that this is a beautiful example. And I think one that's more of uh, more relatable than Antigone to the notion of individual morality. Sam Spade is not by conventional standards, 
a moral character, but he does have individual morality. Another note, the authors of our text seem positively dismissive of the notion that morality can be found in animals, but are they correct in doing so? I have some issues with that. For example, they cite the example of Robinson Crusoe as being outside of ethics or morality so long as he lives by himself. And they seem to posit that ethics only attach when people are actually living together in society. Well, if that's the case, if ethics or morals only attach in the context of human beings in society, is that a matter of them being human beings or is that a matter of being in society? Well, then, if it's just a matter of being in society, what about other creatures that are social animals? Lone wolves, for example, are infamous for being more dangerous than wolves in a pack. Why would that be? Well, in short, wolves are social animals with a strict social code. And sometimes a given wolf may be exiled from a pack if they aren't sufficiently cooperative with the other wolves. Since wolves are best suited for hunting in packs, lone wolves tend to be more desperate than pack wolves, as I gather, and are thus that much more to be feared because they are more desperate. Similar behavior has been found by, biolog by biologists investigating other animals that live in packs or tribes. Uh, for example, mature dolphins in a pod risk their own being, well-being by forming a perimeter around weak or elderly dolphins and mothers with offspring. By doing this, they help to protect the most vulnerable members of their pod against attacks from predators such as sharks. Thus, and this is admittedly my own opinion, but I'm just sharing this to observe that, you know, when you're reading this text, don't just absorb it, think about it actively and critically and independently. I think, and let me run this past you. Do you think there's maybe a, the case for the notion that some rudimentary morality can be discerned not just among human beings, but amongst other social species as well. Could be. Let me make one more, uh, two more observations. There's a section devoted to law and morality, and I think it's worth pointing out that Jim Crow laws before the Civil Rights Act were per se unjust laws. The, pe the policemen who attacked peaceful protesters in the 1960s were arguably acting within the law, but they were acting immorally. The protesters, by contrast, were acting in a moral, but also technically a criminal manner. Similarly, most people would consider the act of feeding the hungry to be essentially a moral deed. But within the past year or so, there have been attempts to enforce laws that would allow policemen to write tickets to people for against people who are caught trying to feed the homeless. The point is that although there is overlap between law and morality or law and ethics, they are not identical. Not everything that is legal is right and not everything that is right, unfortunately, is legal. The textbook also brings up Kohlberg's notion of the levels of, moral, of moral development Although Kohlberg is still well regarded, however, there's another alternative path approach that I think is worth sharing. Another writer, a psychologist by the name of Carol Gilligan wrote a book in response to Kohlberg. It was titled In a Different Voice, and it criticized Kohlberg for focusing almost entirely on boys when he conducted his studies, which he used to identify his six levels of moral development. Gilligan has admittedly controversially argued that there's a difference in the way that males and females reason about morality, but that neither is better than the others. She argues that males assume a identity based on separateness and autonomy, whereas females, Gilligan argues, operate on assumption of connection. They identify who they are with their relationships, with how they connect to each other. Uh, are you defined by how you stand apart, 
how independent you are, or do you identify yourself by who you connect with, what your relationships are? Well, obviously, uh, we're both independent and have autonomy and we have relationships. Here's the thing, I think there's merit but issues with both of these positions. I think Kohlberg is a bit of an absolutist. He seems to think that all human beings go through his six stages of moral development in the same order. However, Carol Gilligan, I think, can be faulted for being essentialist, which is to say that she has this notion that there is something essential and irreducible that separates one sex from the other. Could it be, again, the problem of Aristotelian dualism? Could it be perhaps not an either or, but a both and? Could it be that men perhaps tend to fall towards one side of a continuum and women towards the other side of the continuum? But if that's the case, perhaps the more interesting bit is where the overlap is. Now, I also have some much shorter comments about uh, chapter five, but I think I'll leave those for another time. I've got things to do this evening, folks. So let me know if these observations have added further nuance and clarity to this material, or whether there is some point upon which you would like me to elaborate. I'm looking forward to experiencing this class with all of you. And I hope I'll have the time to film something like this every week, but we'll see. So on that point then, oh, one sec, on that point then, I bid you adieu for the evening. Please read the assigned text. If there's anything about the text that seems troubling or puzzling or difficult, feel free to reach out to me via email, lgeitner, G-E-I-T-N-E-R, at bremen.edu, and I will be glad to do the, my level best to clarify the material that we are covering. Ciao for now.